Good evening, everybody. This is the February 12, 2020, uh, 6 p.m. joint meeting between the Town Council and Board of Education. It's entitled Growth School Enrollment Joint Workshop. Uh, before we begin, where there is one adjustment to the agenda that was published online. We're going to actually have Jay Chase um, present first, and then Rebecca Wendell present second. This is at their request. They got together, and this is at their request. So, quick point of order as we just switch the order. Um, everybody has an agenda in front of them. That should help us with the timing of the meeting. Uh, right off the top, a couple quick things to remind everybody. We're here uh, to essentially come to a common set of facts and language related to growth and school enrollment. Uh, what we're not here to do is we're not here to debate the consolidated intermediate school. We are here all simply to work together to understand the current uh, enrollment projections and or the current growth projections of SCARP. So just right off the top, just want to make that very clear. Uh, secondly, we're going to ask have the presenters finish their presentations and then we'll ask questions afterwards so they're not interrupted. And thirdly, if the agenda seems a little dense and we're running out of steam, please speak up. We'll take a break or what have you. And if, if it turns out the last items get booted, then so be it and we'll have to do it in the future. But I think we get through the first two big parts of the workshop and we'll check in with you. You want to add to that? Is that good? Awesome. Okay. Uh, with that, I think we are going to lead with Jay Chase. Hi, everybody. My <laughs> first bit of applause. So I'm, I'm Jay Chase. I'm the planning director. I know half and not quite the other half all too well, so nice to see those of you on the Board of Education. Um, so as mentioned, Rebecca and I did get together a little yesterday. We both had sort of draft presentations as we're talking through it. It seemed to make sense to do what I'm doing first and then follow her, or have her follow me, I should say. We'll see what work we both done today and um, maybe that changes, who knows. Um, but anyway, so I'm going to just run through a few things. Um, just real briefly, I'm going to touch on sort of the town's growth and put it in the sort of context, the regional context. Um, one of the things I've been asked to focus on is to give an overview of our growth management ordinance. Um, talk a little bit about the residential trend, what we've seen happen since the establishment of that growth management ordinance and some of the um, new type of units we've seen come uh, online in town in the last couple of years. And then at a very cursory level, and Rebecca's going to touch on this a lot more than I will, um, a, a, a beginning of a discussion our understanding about what we looked at back in the summertime um, in terms of pressures um, on the incoming kindergarten class. And I'll get to that as we go. So, um, so I think everyone knows Scarborough's fast growing community has been for many, many decades. Um, so I'm not going to uh, belabor the point. Um, but certainly we can see sort of seven, in the 70s and the 90s we are faster growing decades and, um, but it's been an upward trend and um, anticipates to continue to be so. Um, for me this slide is kind of interesting just to sort of put the growth pressure that we're all feeling uh, in town in context. Uh, we're not the only community in the region feeling this and having these sorts of discussions. Um, you know, this is growth by percentage rate. So, you know, some of these towns are smaller, so, you know, the numbers bear out, but um, I just think it's sort of interesting and, and worth bearing in mind that um, other communities are having similar discussions and dealing with similar issues. Um, and then just, uh, you know, sort of the last slide on the population stuff, so don't, don't get too bored on me. Um, you know, this is a, just an indication of what's been happening over the last uh, eight or nine years in terms of our population. We're, we're getting older, I think we probably all knew that. Our population uh, under five and under 18 has shrunk by uh, total percentage of population, while our older folks, 65 and up, have um, increased by percentage of population. So that's just, again, sort of a quick snapshot of where we're at. So. Now I'm going to get into a little bit of uh, the history of our, our growth management ordinance and growth management discussions in, in town. Um, and so the discussion really begins sort of in the, in the late 90s into the early 2000s. Um, you know, this is sort of a perpetuation of rapid growth in this 
So in a six-year time frame, there are 1,100 new single-family homes developed and 1,200 units, plus or minus. So we're seeing a lot of new single-family homes coming up, come on the market uh, place and, and, and seeing those new residents. And at the time, uh, the community was feeling some of the same pressure we're feeling today. That uh, you know, we had schools that were bursting at the seams, so to speak. There was questions about how can our other municipal services continue to provide um, what's expected. Um, and so those sort of growing pains led to first a, the um, growth and services report, which was sort of led to our growth management ordinance. So what the growth management ordinance is intended to do is to pace the rate of construction in town, not necessarily stop it, or, um, but just to simply pace it so that the municipal services can sort of keep up and, and uh, um, make improvements in advance. Uh, so it did provide for immediate housing needs, allows for annual development, ensures that there's a fairness and all allocation of building permits throughout the town so that not you know, one project sort of gets to do all the development. Um, and then it helps plan for continued residential growth. Um, as you know, that's going to happen. So, how does it do those things? So the first thing it does is we have the town's established an annual allocation. That's a growth cap of 135 um, growth permits in a given year. Um, and it limits those uh, uh, permits no more than 20% to any one uh, subdivision or project. Uh, annually, so that's sort of that equal distribution. One of the other interesting things that the ordinance does um, is it directs growth. In our comprehensive plan, we have areas where we're trying to limit growth to preserve sort of the rural character of our community, and so therefore we're trying to direct growth in areas where we have infrastructure in place that has capacity for growth. Um, so it limits the amount of permits that can be issued in those low growth areas, limited growth areas, to no more than 50 of the uh, of the 135 permits, um, and the ordinance also includes this reserve pool, which is intended to um, address projects that aren't sort of the single-family projects. How you know multi-family projects, affordable housing projects, projects that come through a contract zone process, things that might be a little bit outside of what the community normally might see uh, for residential growth, at least sort of historically. So, you know, the question is, well, how have we done now that we have the growth management ordinance in place? So again, back to the original numbers I showed you about three or four slides ago, we had the 1,100 single family homes from 97 to 2002. Um, in the uh, last six years, from 14 to 19, there was 464 single family units. And that tracks about right if you take any sort of six-year segment over the last, you know, eight, eight to ten years. Um, but it's not necessarily the growth management ordinance that's done all that. And so this slide has a few things going on. So what, we, what you're seeing there, the flat blue line, that's the 135 growth permits that are uh, eligible at, for, through the annual allocation only. This is annual allocation so what you can see is from basically 2008 up to around 2016, we never even hit that annual cap. Um, we, were, we were under that number. So it wasn't necessarily the growth management ordinance that kept us um, you know, from, from growing to a certain extent. It was just whatever market forces were out there. However, clearly something changed in the last couple of years. 2017, 18, and 19 are all years that we exceeded that threshold. Um, and what you'll see here, you, there's actually two lines that, that go together. Um, so the orange line are our growth permits, and the gray line, I suppose it is, are the uh, actual total number of units. And the discrepancy there is, in our zoning ordinance, in our growth management ordinance, we actually allow for sort of a, uh, a residential density factor, if you will, that a, a one bedroom uh, um, unit that's under 750 square feet only counts as a half a unit, and a two bedroom under 1,200 square feet counts as two thirds of a unit. 
So one growth permit could actually equal two one-bedroom units on the marketplace. So that's why the total number of units is higher. And I'm going to get into this. You'll sort of see where, how those numbers play out a little bit later. Jay, can I ask a question? Um, in those years, 2008 to 2016, because I can't remember the answer to this, did we bank? You can't bank what's not used every year, is that correct? That is correct. So in 2008, so it actually used to work that way, okay. and in 2008 there was um, some significant changes to the growth management ordinance at that time, and that's when the reserve pool was created. Um, and, and part of the discussion at that time was yeah, what to do with those remaining units, and as I said, that was the creation of the reserve pool, which We'll talk a little bit about because that's really what's enabled sort of this spike, if you will, uh, at the end of, our, of, the, of the table. Thank you. So you just saw the in 2017. That's where we had that dramatic increase. So 2016-17, um, a couple of things were happening. There was a Around this time, there's a, a big report that came out that talked about the a need of some 5,000 or so units in the greater Portland market, um, housing units of different types. And so there was sort of a lot of regional discussion around that. But then as staff, locally, we were starting to have a lot of developers come through the door and talk about multifamily development, which were not discussions we were typically having for many, many years. Um, so as staff, we identified there, there's things in the pipeline. And so there was a conversation with, with council about that, about sort of what changes might be coming in the market. And so uh, based on sort of what was in the pipeline, the fact that you know, a lot of these projects wouldn't fit nicely into our, into our annual allocation, yet we had zoning in place that, um, in our growth areas that envisioned this type of development that encouraged this type of development. You know, there was sort of this offset between the two. Um, and so based on some work, uh, you know, there was forecasted minimal demands for these multifamily type developments on school and municipal services. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but based on those assumptions, council increased the, the reserve pool from 250 per, um, uh, yeah, permits to 500 permits. Jake, I have a question. So, did, um, did the fractionalization and the increase in the pool happen at the same time? Uh, so, let's see. Uh, the, I can't remember when we introduced the fractional into the zoning ordinance, but into the growth management, excuse me, the growth management ordinance is when those were both embedded, the reserve pool and the fractional units and the growth management ordinance were inserted at the same time. It is... 2008. Uh, 2008, okay. yep. And um, I'd have to go back and look at when we changed the zoning, but I think it was right around that time. It wasn't far off. Um, but the growth management orders had both those things sort of inserted in at the same time. Um, so, some... so if we're not waiting until the end of the presentation, I have a ton of questions. Yeah, so let's wait until the end of the presentation. Oh, I'm sorry. Like, yeah, yeah. There's 20 people at the table. Let's wait until the end of the presentation. Yeah. We're used to asking questions. Yeah, well, not anymore. Sorry. Are you sure I just said something? I said it, actually, Jim Ray. It's how I love the meeting. I wasn't listening. I'll be answering no more questions for the next five minutes. <laughs> All right, so um, this slide, just quickly, I want to go over sort of just so folks know. I think we've all seen it in town driving around, right? There's been a lot of uh, multifamily being built. Um, so this sort of goes through what's been happening. We had a little bit in 2015 and 2016, um, but obviously 2017 was the, that was the big winner. Um, that was when uh, the, the uh, Beacon property across from Cabela's got started. There were some other projects on Muncie Road. Um, so I sort of list what the projects are. And you can see here as well, I've listed the total number of units, but in parentheses, how many growth permits. So um, to the fractional uh, issue, you can see 2015 is just a nice, easy way of seeing it. That was one project, had 32 units. They were all one bedroom. Um, so it was only counted 16 uh, uh, growth permits. <coughs> so just to give you an idea of what, what's been going on out there. Um, you've seen it, now you know what the numbers are. Um, let's see, what do I have next? Okay, 
Um, I just want to give you all a sense of where we're at with the reserve pool, because that's really what's enabling this multifamily um, uh, uh, boom, if you will, or is development style to happen. Um, as I said, you can see on the right hand side there, uh, council <laughs> increased the reserve pool to 500 units, what, three, four years ago. We've uh, issued, or we have reserved, uh, uh, 200 and, what's that, six, 267 and a half of the, uh, of the, of the, um, so those permits, and so that, that actually has created 493 units. Um, so we still have some, uh, you know, 200 or so, a little less permits left, or 180. Uh, so, so now I'm going to jump a little bit to what uh, council had asked staff to look at. Um, this is data from back in, in the summer of 19. Well, what we were asked, council was hearing that there was a large incoming kindergarten class, and there was some discussion about, well, we made this assumption that, you know, or we're seeing there's a lot of multifamily being built, and we're seeing a large kindergarten class, maybe, you know, <coughs> one and one makes two. And so we, working with Rebecca and the school staff, we sort of, we took a look at <coughs> where those, uh, students were coming from. Again, this is just that incoming kindergarten class, so there's a deeper dive that can be done later, and Rebecca and I have already started to talk about that. But really what we found is that there were no children in this class that were coming from the new multi-families. Um, and sort of more, more enlightening, at least from my perspective, is that a full 92% of the students were coming from housing stock that was at least five years old, and quite a bit from housing stock that's older than that still. And what that starts to, um, starts to indicate, and some of the assumptions one can make, is that really what we're starting to see is the turnover in all that single family housing that we did a real good job of building in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s. We're starting to see a turnover of some of those families who have raised their children and maybe are looking to downsize or go to Florida or what have you, and then that there's new generation moving in. Um, and so I think that's something, again, as I mentioned, Rebecca and I started talking about yesterday afternoon, trying to figure out how we can sort of merge our two data sets to uh, <coughs> take a deeper dive into that and really figure out um, what's happening. But that's at least the start of it. And then I believe my last slide, just want to give folks a sense. Uh, just did a quick sort of off the top of the head, uh, sort of what's what's out there, what's in the pipeline. You know, there's a uh, you know, quick, you know, over 300 multifamily um, units that are at any any stage of either before our planning board or we're just really starting discussion with developers. Um, but these seem like sort of real projects, if you will, that might come forward. Um, and then in terms of single and two family. Um, you'll see below cottages, sort of wet in woods and down. That's sort of typical of what we see, single family residential development in the town on a given year. Obviously the cottages at Sawyer are something of a different nature, 92 uh, single and two family units. Um, so that's a, a, a larger subdivision that's out there. Um, so that sort of gives you a sense of what's out there. Uh, I think that's what I have. Hopefully I stay within my time, even with those questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jay. Uh, Ms. Dorgan, you want to lead us off? Um, sure. Have you uh, looked at the Northeastern building in Portland to update any of the growth projections? Northeastern building? Coming in no, yeah. Oh, oh, right. The, uh, no, I have not. Okay. Yeah. And so... I get, my questions are kind of specific to different slides, I guess. Sure. So, can you... push the button. <laughs> yeah, actually, so I have a question on this slide. Right. So, is this spike the year that the town council approved double the number of permits? So, that was the year that the reserve pool was increased, correct. So, it's not... So, the reserve pool is a set... It's a finite number. So, it was set at 500, and when that draws down, it's only the council that can that can fill the pool back up. The annual allocation, every January 1st of every year, we have 135 permits that are available. Um, so yes, that is the year that the council 
So when does the reserve pool get filled back up? When and if the council sees fit. So how many left are left in the reserve pool? Uh, so that was what I had back here. There's about 180 or so. Where did I, where did I come up okay, that, that's fine. I just yep. didn't understand the... Yep. So, yeah, so that's the... So, yeah, we've used 319 and a half. So. Okay. Um, so I guess that answers my question about why our population is still growing at the same rate if our growth ordinance is being observed. Mm -hmm. Is because you've added that many permits. Mm -hmm. I mean, like the original slide okay. showed shows a pretty even growth, but if we're only limited growth to 135 permits whenever you said yep. we did that in like 2000 or whatever. Yeah. We're still growing at the same rate. Is that because we've added so many permits to the 135 that? Um, no, so those, that reserve pool was just added in the last three that actually aren't even really accounted for in this data. Mm -hmm. So I'd say, you know, why, why are we continuing to grow? Because I think there are still houses just being added to the market. It could be how many folks are occupying residents. Um, the data on the last, I think the last, the, second, the school one, can you just talk through how you came up with that? Sure. The data that. Yep. So, yeah, I'm working with Rebecca and your school staff. We took the incoming kindergarten class addresses um, and we mined other relevant data to be sure that you know we can get anything out there should be out there um, and we married that with our building data and we're able to see by address when the structure what type of structure they were in is it a multi-family is it a single family when that structure was built is it you know was it built in the last you know yeah what year it was built and then that's how I sort of did the analysis of um, so uh, you know, 50% uh, of the children were from homes that have been sold in the last five years. That doesn't tell us how old that house is, but just that those are new families coming into the community within the last five years. Or, it, actually, I shouldn't say that entirely. It could be people moving within town, too. So mm -hmm. it's just houses sold within the last five years. So I don't want to overstate that point. Um, but, so that's how we were able to get that data. And again, I think um, we have some good ideas of how we can mine, mine that deeper and really take a deeper cut at what's happening. Um, That's it, Nick. So the reserve pool allocation, which is slide 14. This one? So, yeah. Yep. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm having trouble understanding how these numbers Fair enough. I, mean, I see a 319, but I see a solid line at 300. I see a 493 to be created 500. Yep. I, and then so, I see things out to the right, so I just I struggled with the slide, and I was waiting to see if I could understand it after you explained it. Sorry, I still don't understand it. Not a problem. The orange are the total number of units. Those are units built. So remember, I sort of talked about how you could actually have two units built on one growth permit. <clears throat> so the orange is the number of units that have been built. So that is what gets you to the 493. 353, 48, and 40. Plus, it includes the 52 that are reserved for Piper Shores. Plus 52. Yep. Yep. So, exactly. Those, those orange numbers plus the 53 gets you to um, that 3 to the 493 number. Then to Hillary's question, then you said, you said how many were left? But uh, in the reserve pool? Oh, because it's coming out of two different pools. Right, gotcha. Yeah. Right. So yes, any any projects that come in the reserve pool do not touch the annual allocation. So. Um, and so yeah. with the downs, so there was so because I looked back at some of your presentations, they were great, but it's really <laughs> interesting to watch them. Um, there was a statement that said no, nothing from the downs. Um, comes out of the reserve pool, or does the multifamily housing in the downs come out of, you know, it was, it was an older presentation, so sure. like, yeah, yeah. where does uh, the multifamily housing for the downs come from? So the downs is not able to pull from the reserve pool. There is a, uh, in the growth ordinance, growth management ordinance, interestingly, we say that projects that are providing for a 
affordable housing and getting a density bonus for providing that affordable housing can draw from the reserve pool. Projects that are in a zone that's required to have affordable housing, the only zone that we have is the Crossroads Development uh, District, the Downs, um, inclusionary zoning is not allowed to pull from the reserve pool. Um, so they're required to do affordable housing, but they're not allowed to pull from the reserve pool. So the Downs has, is uh, basically, um, they're going through sort of a multi-phase project doing multiple subdivisions. Um, and so that's how the 126 units or whatever um, have been built in the last year and a half or what have you. Know, so where do their permits come from? Right? From the annual allocation. Oh. Yep, yep, their permits are all from the annual allocation. And again, they... So there's, there's also, within that, um, I can't remember what all their development makeup is, and I see Rocky's in the back, I'm certain if you, you know, wanted to dive deeper, we certainly could, but some of those units, there's been only, I think it's 40 single family units, and then a number of the other units are sort of these smaller units, count fractionally as halves or two thirds, so though there's been 126 total units brought on the market, I think I have that number about right, the permit that wrote permit number is probably something in the order of 70 to 80. Again, I could, we could mine those um, when we take a deeper dive. I know the council's interested. Just really quick, and yeah. I'll let somebody else have a chance. The one half versus two thirds, what is the fractionalization? So one bedroom and less than 750 square feet equals a half a unit. Two bedroom, less than 1,200 square feet, equals two thirds a unit. So you have to meet both those criteria. So if you're two, you know, if you're a, a one bedroom but 900 square feet, that'd be two thirds of the unit. Just to be clear, you need to be both. Items. And that was determined in 2008, right? That was when it was inserted in the growth management ordinance. I'd, Honestly, have to go back and look, but around that time frame, 2006, 7, 8, right, right in that wheelhouse. Yeah. yeah. My recollection is yes. Yeah. Uh, so it was adopted by council. We had committee, yes. our, our long range planning committee, I'm certain, was probably worked on it, sort of vetted through the process, but ultimately, any, any ordinance changes are adopted by council. But is it based on like, the services that they use? Oh, I see. I see. So, like what, why? The, yeah, yeah and, and that was really it. Was that, um, that yeah, that there's going to be less impact on exactly services and um, uh, school services, municipal services, and those sorts of things. That their impacts be lesser than uh, something that might have more. Focus. I will simply say that the fractional piece uh, existed before 2008. It was done for density calculation purposes, and so that same philosophy was brought into the growth management ordinance. And my assumption about that is, uh, you know, number of bedrooms matter, particularly for school impacts. And so, rightly or wrongly, the way this is constructed is really, I think, weighted toward uh, guarding against or appreciating school impacts, and that's where bedrooms matter the most. Right. Like, where, what, how long is that? Who, who, who comes up with how much each bedroom impacts schools? And when did that, when did that person come up with it? And do you ever update that? I don't know the basis of it, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a fairly well-established fact, well beyond our borders. I, I, I think that's so so there's, it, there was a methodology that went into analyzing how many people are typically in a one bedroom and a two bedroom, and it's looking at sort of national data, it's looking at local data, so there's, there's a lot of factors, it's not sort of just a one factor item, um, it's not a one person thing, it's, you know, there's okay. staff, there's So is that consultants. updated yearly? Because I mean, I, I see people, yep. a lot more people living in less space than I mm -hmm. used to, I just am wondering, like, if that... Yep. Yeah. But intuitively, it makes sense. It, it may not make sense in, in the current marketplace. It's worth looking at. Let's go, Nick, and then let's show them again. So we're a little far away from where my original question was, but I do want to touch on this a little bit because it connects to it. So I have, I wrote down the, the portions you were talking about the seven uh, square foot uh, one bedroom versus the small two bedroom. Mm -hmm. And I personally lived in a two bedroom townhouse and developed a lot of children, and each townhouse is 950 square feet. But the assumption these days is that those units don't have children. It, it, it isn't there. Um, 
at least from my observation. Now, I, I'd love to know kind of a little more insight into that because um, I, I just feel I'm a little worried about that because I think some of those assumptions may have changed. Right. And I think that's sort of where I was talking about where Rebecca and I can sort of take a deeper dive. We right. can start to marry those things up. But as I think is even in the, uh, um, the facilities report, or I know we are looking at it yesterday, there, there are sort of national models for trying to understand what how many folks are in there, but it certainly may be changing. Yeah. And the other thing I just wanted to ask a question about real quick, actually, actually more of a comment just for everyone's clarification. You had a slide up there where you talked about the pie chart where you said zero kindergartners. Oh, yeah. So I have some data that was pulled from Power School very recently looking at some of the developments that you referenced, not all of them. I have Carrier Woods, the Downs, Beacon, Dunstan Crossing, and Eastern Village. And currently there are 76 students in our schools, not in kindergarten, obviously, but in our schools that come from those developments. And, and that doesn't include the Oaks, which actually bumps that number up to 140. So, um, so there's a lot of students that are now living in those developments. And that represents 1 20th of our students. So if you want to think about one student in every classroom, being from one of these multi-family developments, that, that's what we're observing in time now. Again, and this data was based on what we were asked to look at, was the incoming kindergarten class, and so that was, that was where Rebecca and I said, we need, to, we need to take a deeper dive here. We understand that, absolutely. Can, can you explain to me um, how you go about when there's competing interest in growth permits, how do you go about prioritizing that interest? It's first come, first serve. Yep. Um, and yeah, so it's first come, first serve, and so it's interesting, My, I wasn't here when the growth management ordinance first went in place, I, you know, Rocky certainly was, but my understanding was that first year, there was a mad rush. People came in and grabbed them, and we hit that limit right away. Well, one of the things that the ordinance says is if you buy a permit, and it, it expires in six months, if you don't turn it into a building permit, and you just, you lost your money. Well, I, my understanding is a lot of people we didn't build all 135 growth permits that were purchased that year. And then that's where that first slide that we go back to, it dropped right off. Because people said, oh, I guess the problem isn't what we thought it was going to be. And now, so, um, so in my, uh, I think it was in 2017, yeah, that was the, the year that we used all the um, annual allocation um, and dipped into reserve pool. I think all the other years we haven't hit the annual. It's one year. It's either 17 or 18. I don't quite recall um, that we haven't hit the annual allocation, but we dipped into the reserve pool to go over the 135 number. So just if I can make a point, multifamily is the phenomenon. You know, we saw multifamily built here 20, 25 years ago. Uh, a couple of notable projects and then nothing for reasons the only the market can explain. And then we saw this this big spike. Something really unique about multifamily is just the pace of construction. You can build 12 units under one roof. And so uh, just think about building 135 single family homes. Just the sheer time it takes to create the road system, dig the foundation, build the house. Um, multifamily can be run much, much quicker. And so yeah, that's just an added dynamic that we've not seen. Leanne, and then who wants on deck? Right. Leanne and Betsy? I was going to say, one of my questions Nick answered for me. Thank you. I was going to go back to that. I'm going to go back to the square footage of the two-bedroom apartments on the two-thirds. And you probably saw me getting a little puzzled. I went back, my three-bedroom house is less than that. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering if we can take a look at the numbers and try to right-size whether it should be a full unit at 1,250 square feet in a two-bedroom. Um, versus the two thirds, because I think that could have true impact to services. Ken, and then Ken. Ken first. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't there also a further definition of the two thirds? It goes up to eighteen hundred square feet, two bedrooms on a slab. There's some anomaly in there. I do believe there's four definitions. Is that correct? Don't no. Understand. I can pull it up when, uh, when Rebecca's doing her presentation. It goes yeah. up to 1,800 square feet. Well, it's two bedrooms, 1,200 square feet or less is two-thirds. So once you, if you're at 1,300 square feet, it would count as a full unit. So I'm not, okay. I, I'll have to take a look at that. No. Okay, thank you. Oh, so on the pipeline projects, which is slide 16, 
Um, I just had a, a quick question on that. So you're saying these are units, right? Not uh, permits. Is that right? These are actual units, not permits. That is correct. Okay. Um, so where where their pipeline? It's hard for me to make a understanding of right. if they're going to be eligible from the reserve pool. What type of how big their units are going to be? How many bedrooms? So I really was just trying to get a do a unit down. Right, I understand these are pipeline. Yep. Um, but I know with like the down space to residential. I guess in the opening um, workshop with the planning board, uh, with people quartered in those days, which is very kind. Um, the planning board did ask how many units. Um, they thought that it was 230 something. Okay. I don't know if that's changed, but that was in the opening meeting. So, I mean, these pipelines are just that, right? Yeah. You really, these, you really don't know. These, these numbers these could, could go up, higher. they could go down, yeah. projects could walk away. A good example is, I, I mentioned back in 2017, we were looking at pipeline projects. There was another project that was in the pipeline at 330 units that never came. But there were other projects that we didn't know about that sort of filled that. So, you know, sort of take these for what they are. They're my best guess based on conversations we're having currently. Um, and I don't purport they're anything more than that. From your slide on uh, Scarborough Road 5 to 19. Um, uh, so, I'm sorry, which one? Slide 11. That one, yeah. Here? So, on that, these are actual permits that have been taken out. So these are things that, unless we let them expire, we think are going to happen. These are these are the road permits that have been issued. In yes, right. So unless so unless they expire and and they expire within six months, so I'd say it's just uh, all these are pretty much yeah, the, happening. Are units uh, the permits issued or units actually delivered? Yeah. These exist. These are not expected. These exist. Yeah. Yes. So, Yep. So what's in the actual pipeline for the permits been issued? Um, so I guess between 19 and 20, the permits... So the in permits the last are, two months? Well, I mean, so presumably I could have taken out a permit in October and it wouldn't be in this number if I haven't built it, right? Is that what you're saying, Tom? These are built in the market. This graphic is showing built units. Built and units. Issued permits. Right. So one thing I did try to do, so in terms of... Um, I didn't pull all the growth permits for this year yet. I don't think there's been very many. January and February were pretty slow. I could certainly ask um, uh, Robin in my office to pull that. But the one thing I did pull out, because we're talking about the reserve pool, is um, the Bessie Commons, that's the, the next phase of the Bessie School Senior Housing. That was the only other project uh, that was eligible for the reserve pool. Um, and so they pulled theirs this year, um, but they haven't attached it yet to a building permit. So this is this is another sort of oh, hard part of putting the numbers together. Okay. People can grab a growth permit, but not grab a building permit for months down the road. So sometimes things look a little off. So, um, uh, Jay, could you yeah. clarify, affordability is a requirement for dipping into the reserve pool? It's not the only affordability. Uh, could you, list, could you list the requirements that would trigger us being able to go into the reserve pool? Do they have to meet all the requirements or just so, one, or one or more? One or more. Here we go. So it's developments that use density incentives. Or, so in a couple of our zones, our growth zones, they're sort of the, um, we allow density bonuses if someone's providing for affordable housing. Um, and that's not an option someone can take advantage of, or if they're doing our development transfer program, which is conserving open space in the low growth area, they're allowed to get extra density in the growth areas. Um, affordable housing projects are eligible, um, a, as well as projects that come through contract zone, and those are items that are approved by council. And so a good example of that is Piper Shores Phase 2, I listed. Um, that's the 52 permits, I think it was 52, might be 58, uh, reserve pool permits that are pending because council's already deemed this project is going to use those. So I've taken those out of the pool. They, they haven't been occupied, they haven't been utilized yet, but they're, we're holding for them. And then the fourth uh, one is, and I don't think it would apply to anything at this point any longer because this was in the ordinance when it was originally established so almost 20 years ago. It was projects that were approved 
prior to the growth management ordinance coming in line that already had multifamily development uh, tied to it. So I just don't foresee that one. Yeah. I'm going to ask one question and then move to Ken after me. Ken, then April, and then John. Is the Downs considered individual development and they can only use 20% of our allocation, or is that not the case? That is not the case. Yep. Okay. Uh, Ken. Just a quick follow up since we had mentioned it. I think the definition of the six, you know, two thirds. Yeah. And it is like, as you state, you know, two bedrooms less than 1,200 square feet. Yep. Of living space or a live work unit. Uh, live Maybe work that's space. what you need to find on uh, no more than 1,800 square feet. Yep. What's the work unit? A live work unit, we've actually never had any of these built in town, so. <laughs> but it, the concept is, was, um, it's been on the books for as long as I've been in town. Uh, sort of the first floor would be a studio space office, second story would be where someone lives, and they would be open to each other, um, and so they would be one seamless unit. Um, however, whenever we've seen folks sort of come in to build anything like this, they've said, well, I want two separate units, but I want to rent out one separately from the other. So, uh, so a live work is defined in our zoning ordinance. Okay. haven't seen anyone actually ever uh, take advantage of it. April? Can you please go to the slide that lists all of the current multifamily developments by name? Which of these covers the best stuff? That would be Southgate, 2018. Okay, thank you. John? Is that it, April? I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, John? You mentioned uh, the project in 2017 for 350 units that never came to fruition. Oh, right, yes. What happens if somebody buys that development? I, I assume it's pre. No, it, 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 was, it, it was only at. Um, uh, Concept staff level never even rose to. Um, did ever come to plan for sketch plan? There's never a formal application. It's worth noting the Beacon project, the 288 units that are still under construction on the parkway, uh, those were approved by contract zone, and so that's how they access mm -hmm. the reserve pool. Right. That was a very conscious, <laughs> deliberate action of council by way of approval of contract zone. And that was done after some very thorough analysis and thought about it back. Nick, how many, how many kids are, you told me earlier, how many kids are getting picked up in the beginning? Uh, currently eight. Eight. And do we know how, how many occupied units are on the beacon right now, Jay? So nine of the 12 buildings have, uh, are occupied, and there are 24 units per building. Roughly 200 units, so it's yeah, roughly 216 units? I do think it's total. Yeah. It may already be clear, but just to be clear, the projects that listed, these didn't all pull from the reserve pool. This is a mixture of projects that pulled from reserve pool as well as from the um, annual allocation. These are just the multi families. Um, it, just to follow up, how many units of, so there's, I believe, if I'm hearing this right, there's approximately 216 units of the beacon occupied. Occupied, I think. So, so they have. So here's the difficult part for our department. We issue uh, occupancy uh, sure. for a building. Yeah. yeah. When they rent those out and lease those out, that's okay. that that we don't track. Do you do you know but roughly? But I think I've heard their lease up rate is pretty fast. Yeah. That when they're getting occupancies, people are moving in. You know, so of those, what you just came up 216. with, two sixteen. Yeah. You know, are all two sixteen being rented today? I don't know, but I bet it's a darn good number of it. It's pretty close to that. Do you know how many of those 216 roughly percentage-wise are two-bedroom versus three-bedroom versus one-bedroom? Um, it's out there. It's out there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I'm trying to tax my memory here, so because each building is the same, 24 units, I think, of those 24 units, three or four are three-bedroom in every building. And then the other whatever's left, half or one and half or two bedroom. I'm giving you rough numbers yep, here, but you get this sense yep. sense of scale anyway. Don't hold me to the exact, but we can pull those easily enough for you. Yeah. There's 102 one bedroom in there, and then 144 two bedroom and 42 three bedroom. There's 42 three bedroom there? Mm -hmm. 
when it's all done. When it's all done, yes. And just the other thing about, and this isn't hard and fast, but the price point matters, and we could as a, as a, a different price point than some other multifamily. Uh, certainly there are also subsidized, uh, subsidized uh, units as well, which uh, arguably you know, bring a different level of impact. So they're not all created equal. Bedroom isn't the final determinant. There's a number of other factors. I guess the final point I'd make, I'm not a real estate developer, uh, but it does appear that multifamily fad is, uh, is, is, is waning pretty quickly. Uh, and that window is closing. So I, my hunch is, talking to some folks in the development community, we're not going to see that sort of pace continue. This is kind of a two or three year window that was open. Everyone rushed to it. They filled the market with demand. And I think you're going to see it start to close up pretty quickly now. All right, well, we budgeted 40 minutes for this, and we started 10 minutes late, so we're five minutes over. So if there's anything pressing, I'm going to relieve Jay of his duties. And Leanne's, it is officially Leanne's meeting for the next hour. Or 40 minutes. It's about 40 minutes. Yeah. And so we'll hear from Rebecca. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jay. Yeah, happy to do it. Thank you. I'll be hanging around. <laughs> <laughs> Another applause. Yeah, you guys. Three more meetings like this. Applause. I do for my projections is look at those first, what are those trends. I then look at our first grade enrollment six years later, what's going on there, is there an migration, an out migration happening. Um, and an example of that would be we look at 2018, and that's what this is all based on, my projections for 2018. So in this that we're looking at, 2019 was projected, of course we know what that information is now just to get an idea of how to talk about different things here. But that would be going back to births that were 2011 and 2012. 
So the next thing, after we look at that, after we look at all that, see what's going on, I look at the grade-to-grade -grade migration trends. What happens when that first grader goes to second, to third, to fourth, and so on? And over time, you, the trends develop into patterns. You know, do we always see in-migration at this grade level? Do we always see out-migration at this grade level? And I'm sure you, know, you already know we have in-migration happening at our lower levels. And then sometimes as our students move from the middle school onto the high school, there's no migration. And that's as students start to choose where they want to go to their high school, whether they go to charter school, private school, whatever. The next part after I did all of that is I did look at the housing, and I had to look at and see what's the development been like over the last 10 years. And as Jay talked about, it was up, it was down, and right now we've been off a bit with the, those multifamily units. And then I want to know, has it impacted school enrollment? What would the potential impact of future be? And does that best fit model, that, that base model, does it adequately account for what's been happening? So just looking at housing units, again, mine are a little bit different than what Jay had. So I didn't support any of those studio or bedroom units. Took out the age-restricted type units and then to see what's actually going on. And you can see there was a time period here, 2008, we all know, economic recession right there. Housing went down, there wasn't so much going on. And then as time went on and things got better, it starts to creep back up again. And we do have this cap on growth permits, and we know that there's a difference between growth permits and our building permits. So I have to kind of go by averages. What's going to happen on average? Well, granted, you can pull growth permit in one year and conceivably have the building permit the next year, and maybe by the time that house is done, it's another year. So there is some averaging that has to be kind of considered here. Um, and 135 is sort of my average to look at. So big question is, how many units did that 2018 model account for? And looking at preschool migration again, that's the migration between births and kids coming into the first grade class. Um, what I found was it accounted for about 90 new units. And if, like, 2019, we had 126, I think you said, right? 126? Something like that. So obviously that's, hmm, interesting. It might not have enough preschool migration uh, accounted for in that best fit model. The elementary migration was about 132. So that gives me a little bit of an idea of what the best fit model might be as far as projecting. It might be a little bit under. The next part I looked at was this multifamily housing impact. And a, a large number of these multifamily projects were discounted from my study. I didn't look at, um, I think it's Eastern Village has one of my rooms. There were a number of others that just had one of rooms. I took out any of the units. So really the projects that were, were of concern were the Vesta and the Eden. Like Carrier Woods had already been built. They were already in our school system from that. Um, Burnham, they were already in our system. Obviously, the Oaks East and West had been built. Those were already in. So those kids are already accounted for in those in-migration trends that I use. The big ones that were not were Avesta and Beacon. So the Avesta project with those 38 affordable units is counted 18. It's really 20 units is what's one of the interest of what's happening there. The Beacon, 288. Again, discounted at all those 132, so that left a lot fewer units to actually look at and see what's the impact. So after I looked at all of that, I did a whole other analysis, and I think we kind of touched on it a little bit, is what's the overall impact of a, um, a student in the schools per unit? So I came up with these two different scenarios. The first scenario looked at all the different existing housing stock that we had that was multifamily. So that was Burnham and um, Perry Woods was already in there. Um, Meadow, which had two, three, four bedrooms. And was Meadow Woods is what it's called, the Oaks East and West Coach Lantern. See what's going on. And all of those combined created a little bit of a different impact on enrollment than if we looked at projects that specifically had those one, two, and three bedrooms. Three bedrooms were like finding brought in more students. So I said, I'm not sure which way this is going to go with these projects, so let's create two different scenarios. Um, one has a little bit more coming in in each grade model. So in the end, I created six different models because I honestly didn't know which way this was going to go. I said, let's look at all the different scenarios so we could do some planning. 
I'm not going to go through all of these because it's far too much and it would take too long, but that's, those are the different models. The first one, best at the base. I added in the different impact scenarios from the multi family. I did another one assuming we max out on our growth permits and growth <coughs> permits at an average of about 135. We know how this kind of goes. It goes up and down. Might be a little bit different for each year. So for this, I said, well, let's take a look and say I've got you know, these projections. How does it pan out? What's our enrollment look like as of February 1st? Are we seeing these impacts that we thought we were going to see or are we not? Um, I looked at the best fit model and I looked at the multi-family impact model. Because those were kind of the two I said, let's focus on those and see what's going on. So first I'll talk a little bit about BURST. Um, the green is the BURST, and again, this model is based on last year's projections. So a little bit of that blue, the 2012 BURST, that's actually our 2019 class. But the green is what's impacted our past first grade enrollment. And you can see over time it's declined. Um, there was a decline, average decline in 28 births. That's basically a class size. Granted, it's all not at one of our primary schools, but it's across the different schools. If you look at the blue, you see it going pop back up, plus down a little bit. And then if you look at the end, I, I went and said, well, what's happened in 2018, 2019? 162 births. I estimated there would be 146, so right there, I know, you know this model is not going to be good after a period of time. It's going to underestimate how many kids that we have coming in. Um, but that's not until, I think, it's 2025, so we have some time to worry about that. But just to give an idea, it looks like BURST might be going back up again. Three years is a trend. Let's watch it over the next couple, see what happens. Preschool migration trends, another thing I like to look at, what's happened over the last 10 years. The first five years of the 10-year period I looked at, it's about 30% in migration, 37% in migration. So that's a pretty healthy level of in migration, kind of on par with Falmouth. Um, I will say MSC D51 had more striking, there's this double, a little scary for them. But I mean, we are on par with some of the other similar area schools. The last five years have been 45%, last three went down a little bit, 42. Looking at 2019 in, my, in migration compared to that first, uh, the first, 30%. <coughs> That's actually the third highest over the time period. So nothing to kind of go, you know, it's not super high, but it's still, it's on that high level. So we'll have to watch again, see what happens in the future. So first one, <coughs> class size, this is just historical, looking at 2018-19 enrollment on there. It went down from an average of 217 to the last three years, 186. So overall, that's a loss of about 30, 31 students on average. Where does that come from? First. First go down, first goes down. Even though we still have that in migration continue. So let's look, this is the, the two different models I decided to kind of focus on. Green, obviously that's still remaining the historical, blue, best fit. The bigger blue line there, that's the multifamily high. The red dot, that's our current enrollment. So if we look at 2019 under the best fit, estimated 218. Under the multifamily impact high, estimated 223. Right now we have 222. So guess what, looks like multifamily high. That's the model. Mm -hmm. However, get to the next one. We look at K2 enrollment overall. And that's where I kind of went interesting. So we looked at I looked at the projection for the best fit, 649, projection of monthly families, 664. And I said, huh, our enrollment is 648. So a little bit closer to the best fit. I went, well, all right, we put that aside and let's look at the other models to see what's going on there. Three through five enrollment has a different story. We look at our current enrollment, 670, that's really close to our multifamily impact high, it has 670, 667. It's a little higher than that model. Definitely not anywhere near close to the best fit model, it's gone up a bit. So, kind of, all right, so we're still seeing something very close to multifamily. Look at 68 uh, enrollment at the middle school, which I'm intimately familiar with. And we have a best fit model of 679, projection, multi-family high projection, 691, as of February 1st, is 699, and right now we're up over 700. 
So we've still had some kids coming in. Looking at the high school estimate under the best fit was 967, wealthy family high was 981, current 987. So again, that's higher than was even estimated under that wealthy family high. Not by a lot, but it's still showing a pattern here. So let's look at the overall enrollment, K through 12. The model had projected for best fit was 29.50, multi family high, 303. Right now we have 304. So again, this is really looking like, all right, so that best fit multi family high model is the one. I will say, however, so the, the part that made me go, what's going on here, was that K through uh, 2 enrollment, which was a little bit lower, followed the best fit. So let's, let's take a little bit more of a depth. We'll see what's happening. Pleasant Hill. I have projected around 200. Um, right now we have 203. That's pretty close. I looked at Blue Point, projected 206, but 203. Again, pretty close. Eight corners for best fit was 243. We have 242. Okay. So that's where I said this is where Beacon was supposed to be really impacting our eight corners enrollment. And I kind of said, well, let's see. What made me kind of think of that is Jay's. Um, your, your information is not so many coming pre K. So, looking at the newer counts here into the best fit multifamily high, I previously didn't present this information on a grade by grade basis, and there was a reason for that. When I looked at everything as for multifamily, it was on grade groups. So, I looked at K through 2 as a grade group, 3 through 5 as a grade group. So, it's really hard for me to say how many kids exactly is going to come into each grade. I have to basically say, okay, it's going to be 10, we're going to cut that three, put it in. We all know we're going to have a point three of students, so we're going to some rounding. And it gets to be a little bit less reliable because we have these averaging that we need to use. But still, when, we, when I took a look at it, I said, all right, again, Pleasant Hill saying, because you know, we didn't have to do anything. Two points a little lower, eight corners, that's the one that stands out. 254, and actually 242 is the enrollment. So, the, the interesting thing that I found when I looked, and similar, and you pulled some information too, about where did these students come from? Please tell me where these new kids came from. Avesta. Of the 20 units, we have 20 students. So that's a pretty high in migration from that one project. The Beacon, eight students for nine occupied units. And again, like Jay said, I'm not sure that how many of these are actually occupied? They have permits, but um, I'm not sure actually how many units are occupied. I didn't have any way of knowing that. But looking through the different new students that we have, I said, wow, it is pretty interesting that our new students have come from a variety of housing. Some of it's new, some of it's old, some of it's old multifamily, some of it's the new multifamily. So we've got this huge variety of where our kids are coming from. And even though we didn't see that huge in-migration from Beacon, our enrollment is still at where that multifamily high impact model is. So it kind of leads me to the question of what's going to happen um, in the future. And I don't crystal ball, I can't you know, predict the future. But going back and looking at this, this was what I had looked at, looking at how many students we have, how many units there were. And it makes me wonder, Okay, so the Avesta project had an in-migration that's even higher than the Oaks, which was our highest impact on our enrollment. The Burnham Woods, uh, actually that's not the lowest, Carrier Woods is our lowest impact. And I'm wondering, maybe this beacon, because of the price point of where it's at, maybe it's going to be lower. However, when Oaks came on initially years ago, and we had this conversation of it didn't have a huge impact right away, it took time, and we might find out that beacon, same thing. We may not see it this year, maybe not next year, but as time goes on, those units are available. They're three bedroom, maybe the price point becomes more affordable for some families. Who knows? But it's something that needs to be kind of considered and thought after. And as far as going forward for next year's enrollment, I still, even though the multifamily impact hasn't been as much, I still think that, that best fit multifamily high model is the one to watch. We'll see next year for the moment for sure, but I still think that's one that's going to predict and 
one of the things I do want to touch on is even without that, even if we don't even consider that, the best fit model does show you know, it's going to go back up, the reason first increasing in that in migration is continuing. Mm -hmm. I don't see that changing anytime soon. If it does, that's something you want to consider. So the recommendations of continue to watch those first. As I said, it went up to 162. We already know that's going to impact our 2025 enrollment. We've got to watch that. Is it going to stay at that higher level? We're going to go in even higher. As we have more of these units become occupied, we have more women who potentially can have children. Um, we all want to keep watching those preschool and elementary migration trends for changes. And, that, and people at the school level notice this right away. Hey, I've got a whole bunch of new registrations. Something's happening here. So we're going to want to keep an eye on that. Um, and then I changed my recommendation to track the new students from all housing types over the next three years. And as we kind of discussed yesterday as we were looking at information, let's get a, a list going of these, where are these kids coming from? Let's look at the type of housing projects that they're coming from. Is this more turnover of existing housing stock? Is it new single family? Is it multifamily? Or is it all of it? And I have a feeling it's more of all of it. It's coming from everywhere. And part of it, you know, Scarborough has a great school system. I think what our high school is now fifth in the state. We have all these positive things going for us. People want to move here. Um, and then just keep watching these housing trends. If we have a recession, obviously, we have a different conversation. Uh, if things keep going strong and the building keeps going as it is, well, we're on a path for growing numbers. And I think that is it. Whichever people. Um, Rebecca, do you take into account, and I may be overthinking this, but the turnover in rentals, or do you know what the average length of stay is in a, like, a rental? Because they are a rental turnover. Right. You know, someone buys a house. They're there. We're finding, I'm a real estate broker, and we're finding now that people are now staying in houses in average 10 years, or it used to be 7 years. Right. Um, but I didn't know. Because you're going to have people moving in, particularly these lower, right. more affordable rentals. They might move. For but they might move and they might not stay in Scarborough because they can't afford it. Right. So. And that's one of those things that I don't specifically look at those and say what's the turnover because sometimes we have people go out and people come right. in. Right. But in these, when I do the projections, it looks at trends. Mm -hmm. So when we have some of this movement in and out, it's taken into account into our migration trends. It's not specifically set aside, you know, this is this from this unit, not from that unit. Mm -hmm. But over time, we see an average, even with our Oaks and uh, I the other one? Um, Coach Lantern. Mm -hmm. That one also has the three bedroom units, and that's been around for some right. time. I mean, even with those, we still had solid. In migration, in some years, yes, we have kids go out, but we, they're generally replaced. But someone's coming back. Yeah, in. someone's yeah. coming back in. The affordability. Right, and it yeah. might be neighborhood to neighborhood to neighborhood. Like you know, Pleasant Hill is one that this didn't impact it. Multifamily, there just weren't any multifamily, but that didn't mean that they weren't seeing people right. move in. Because Pleasant Hill area is pretty well sought after, so people still want to move there yeah. with the house market. And I can tell you anecdotally yeah, from my own business that we are starting to see older people downsizing, moving out, and this is moving in. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I know someone who's done that, and they stayed in Scarborough. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, they may have moved out of their 2,000 square foot home, but they stayed in Scarborough. But I'm also home. selling a lot of cash deals to older people. Well, my age with no kids are moving to some big houses too, so we'll be in. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and that's why there's, you know, a per unit where Avesta is one of those that's kind of striking, where it's 20 units and 20 kids. That's, I'm that's, not that's one to, well, not surprised, but at the same time, it's something we want to consider. If we have another project along those lines, that's going to be something you want to consider, you know, the, the overall impact mm -hmm. of what will happen. Because if it's one to one and you have 100 units, oh boy. Um, if it's something like the weekend, and so far we're not seeing it quite yet, but I'm not gonna, I'm not ruling it out yet. Just it may not be as much as we think. Mm -hmm. So overall, right now we see that immigration of 28 students, and I think in this year I had estimated 52. 
because I didn't think that we'd see that full impact of multifamily the first year because some of them are still being built. So it's a, it's you know definitely under what I estimated, but it's not unhealthy either. Uh, I have a question for you on one of your assumptions, you know, on multi uh, the impact on multi family units. I noticed that you uh, you zeroed out on the impact from one bedroom units. Yes. Is, is that a fair or accurate assumption, number one, and is there any way to verify that? That has always been sort of a, a, a standard as mm -hmm. far as what we consider overall impact, and I'm not sure if it comes from um, the national reviews of it, but one bedroom units generally don't have any I mean, They might have babies or small toddlers, but we don't typically see somebody moving in with multiple children living in a one bedroom unit. And actually, I think some of the renters won't allow. But the, they won't allow it. Multiple children, any children. Right? Yeah. You're treating that as a zero. Just as a zero impact. And, and just looking over our, you know, note being from the school district and looking over where kids are coming from, I can say there aren't any from those projects. Um, you know, if they're at Carrier Wood, say, I don't necessarily know if they're in the one bedroom units or in the two bedroom units. But that impact from those projects that have one bedroom and two bedroom is definitely not at the same level as the, in, the ones like the Oaks that you have those three bedroom units. Plus, families want to be where other families are. So if there's a development in it that has one and two bedrooms and there's only a handful of kids, somebody may maybe not like that as much as saying, oh, the Oaks, lots of kids, they'll have friends. Or you know, one of the other developments in the area. Uh, so, uh, so in your longer presentation, which I was able to watch, was really good. Um, you did notice an impact difference on the schools for, um, and you're kind of alluding to it now, but for the complexes that were one and two bedroom versus yeah. the complexes that were one, two, and three bedrooms. Right. Um, and that's yes, exactly. And and that was the impact of the three bedroom units. I noticed there was a, a much stronger uh, correlation between them. I wonder if my old presentation, <coughs> my old presentation I did go into that a bit more in detail mm -hmm. and say, okay, what's happening in these projects that have one, two bedroom units? What's going on in projects that have one, two, and three? And there was definitely a difference between, well, just here you can see the Oaks mm -hmm. had a point six <coughs> students per unit. Meadow Woods, which has three bedrooms, is 0.48, and Coach Landry, 0.43. But then you look at Foxcroft, that's all, I think those are all two bedrooms. Yep. Mm -hmm. So it's 0 0.17, big difference mm -hmm. in actual impact overall. So if we're talking about building multifamily units in, I think the Eastern Village, all of those one bedroom? The, the apartments. Yeah, the apartments, one bedroom. I just took that out off the table completely. Because I, you know, if there is one or two students statistically on a 3,000 school enrollment, that's really marginal. And the other, another question I had it had to do with like trying to compare your data to Jay's data. So I think you like you definitely answered it. I think, but it's so stunning. I just wanted to be sure. So on on this slide, the housing units 2003 to 18. Yeah, that yes. one. Yep. So you show 2017 at about you know 155, 160 units. Yep. And yes. Jay shows that at over 450. Right. So we're yes. saying that vast difference was all senior housing mm -hmm. and one bedroom houses. Or, or, or is that units, the multifamily units, or studio units? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's that's a significant difference that we put 300 something. So that. So for the town council, that's a different impact, traffic, right. natural resource access, things like that, but not necessarily school impact. So right. um, I, I just was like, wait a minute, okay, these two things should look alike. You right, know, and, and that's I, why I was like, he should, should really go first to, first to kind of explain yeah. those differences before I get it, because then you'd be like, well, hold on, why is right. I saying there's so many more? So a lot more questions, I mean, this is because I don't know, but so you were, so you, you uh, your projections, you know, clearly were, with your model, very spot on. So, it fall away into um, just how many are going to be built anyhow. Are they taking the demand from other places in town? 
it, it's not restricted right, to the point because it's sectionalized. They're still really part of the multi-family. You're kind of your second model. Yes. Um, which yeah. It's kind of interesting because your numbers were right on, but you didn't include them. You know what I'm saying? Like right. Because I, so, I didn't think they were going to be additional beyond that 135 unit. That kind of average growth. There was a big question of. Will that create additional growth? Are we going to meet that 135 units? Or are they going to take the demand that's already there and just be the majority of what's built in town? That was the big question. We don't okay. know. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll we have try to, to do the multi-family factor, I guess I'll call right. it. It was, you were thinking of that in the 135 floor. Okay. Yeah, so Thank you. You know, we'll see. And that's, all of this is, it's, it is pretty interesting. It's going right along that multi-family impact. But the multi-family impact wasn't quite as high as, as, as expected. So that also makes me go, hmm, are we seeing higher levels of in-migration just period? Mm -hmm. And I won't know until you know, we get our hands on doing this again at some point. Yeah, just a, a point of reference. Um, our kindergarten pre-registration just opened up a few weeks ago. And so it's really early. Um, early February, the school's not going to start till the end of August, and just as a point of reference, um, we currently have about 170 kindergarten students registered. Um, and this year, our number of kindergarten students is 232. We yeah. have six months um, to go between now and the time it's I think at this time last year, our pre-registrations were one Yep. I want to say Yeah. So that the also that's also good to take into account for that all of the the reasoning might be right. a little different. It might yeah. still be what And we have been right. matching your projection on a month to month basis when we do our enrollment reports. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's the best fit, multi family high. Uh, yeah. 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 Following a question to the one thirty figure that Sarah mentioned. So what happened between the one thirty and actual enrollment? Last year. So actual kindergarten enrollment right now is 232. It's just, this is just pre-registration, so they have for now the August, yeah. August to register. Right. So this the pre-registration. This year, right last time we had 130 pre-registrations, yeah. and we now and we now have 232 actual kindergartners. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This this year we now have 170 pre-registrations. Which makes us feel like our actual kindergarten numbers are also going to be. But, but how many of those are used? We, we haven't done that data. Yeah. yeah. We don't know. So, so, that, so to your question, like to know where they're coming from, where yeah. they're living, we don't get. Yeah. Yeah. If you're really trying to track growth, you want to figure out. Yes. There's, there's a slight new birth that's coming up right? too. So right. I, I think that's well, anticipated. We're going to end up seeing a, a much okay. higher level. We won't be able to. Remember that Rebecca's projections do more than that. It's not just about housing, it's about birth, it's yes. about right. migration. There's mm -hmm. a lot of other factors that come into So when we talk about growth and all of we're talking about a lot more than growth and right. yeah. And in fact, there's a, a, a spike in birth that is going to be coming on your first step soon. About six years from now. And I think, Don, to your question, so yeah. five years yeah. ago, we yeah. don't know yeah. what the kindergarten actual enrollment will be for next year because it hasn't happened yet. But if we look at last year as an example, all we're saying is that we're ahead of where we were last year. Right. By, yeah. So it, the angle I'm taking is a little different. If we're really talking about potentially, you know, uh, a new school, I'm jumping ahead here, so forgive me, but if we're talking about rationalization. You're about to break a rule, Don. <laughs> <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> <laughs> if we're talking about a rationalization, through two school, and that's based on enrollment, growth in, of enrollment, then then how how does this, this data get us to that point? So I mean that yeah. that's so I understand all the other factors. Right. It's not you know we're trying to tie this to to a growth a development building in town, but we're also trying to compare, you know, regardless of reason, you know, what what's the rationale and what's the justification for, you know, for building a new school. So some of that I can't answer because oh, I have to do with the <laughs> capacity and sizing. However, but if I just enrollment alone, um, the projections, if we don't even consider housing, just 
same same, everything stays the same. With our increases in births and our migration trends, which in Scarborough has stayed pretty solid. I and mean, year to year, there's a change, obviously. Pretty but solid and stable? stable? Yeah, well, they, as I talked about, the, the preschool in migration had been at 37%. It went up to 45. Three year was 43. Three more recently, 48. So we're still, I mean, we're still seeing in migration that's gone up. And then the wage grade, same thing, it keeps going up. So even if we just say, okay, what if all of these trends stay the same, nothing really goes on, we're still going to see an increase mm -hmm. in those, the K2 enrollment. Um, and then as I, you know, so bursts, I'm already off on bursts. So I see where that little dip is, that's nah, not going to happen. Because we had so many more babies born. If everything stays the same, and again, this is where the crystal ball and projecting the future, but if all of that stays the same, that number is actually going to go up a little bit, mm -hmm. and we'll see higher. <coughs> yep. yeah, there's, there's one factor that, well, there's several factors, obviously, you know, there's one that really stands out to me, and actually Don was hitting on it, and, and that is the outside growth impact and, and the births. That, and how much that's going to hit us. I think the graph that you got up there had a very high peak at the very, very end, which is this year. And then looking six years in the future, that could signify a lot of students. And when I think back to Jay's graph from earlier in this evening, I think about the proportion of where our students are coming from. I think it was like 5% or something, incredibly low number that are coming from brand new multi-units. I think the biggest wedge actually came from older housing stock, right? Mm -hmm. So I mean, so what we're talking about, growth is an important factor here, but it's the dynamics of the town, it's the turnover of our existing housing. And I live in a, in a house that's 50 years old, I can tell you that everyone around me in Pleasant Hill, those houses are selling. Yeah, new families are coming in. And so that's why the birth rate, I think, almost is more accurate with that, because we're talking about how family dynamics are shifting and moving forward in our housing stock, regardless of whether it's new or not. Um, so I think that's an important factor. And that solidifies for me even more the importance of this new school. Because if we're just talking about growth in town and growth in new units, then that was pretty compelling. But when I see this kind of unexpected surge in birth, which I'm sure isn't going to drop off in a year unless something radical happens, in our economy, that signifies something serious six years down the road, which yeah. is about the time a new school we're going on. And, and where we're talking six years out, I think it's, I, I always hate to do this because I don't want to appear like, hey, pay me more, but you're going to want to keep watching this yeah. and keep seeing what's going on, and especially if it changes. I mean, right now, great. You know, that one model is following along that. Next year, great. It might be the same, but three years from now, we might go, okay, something's a little off here. And we won't know until time progresses on. But as you get closer to actually finalizing the size of that school and how many you know, spaces you need, you will want to take a look at this again. Maybe not the full extent of what I did, but just looking at Lisa in a cohort and saying, what, what are the trends? Has anything really changed? Um, are we still on this path? <coughs> Jennifer. So I'm going to try with some questions. Um, so your investment model relies on historical averages, right, to... Correlations. To, to yeah. project into the yeah. future. And historically, we've added so many units per uh, per year. Have you looked at how that the distribution of one-bedroom, two-bedroom, single-family units has changed over the past 10 years? The distribution as in what... Uh, the, what for the typical stock that comes on, okay. what's embedded in the, the averages that we're using. Right. And that's one of those where we thought maybe the deeper dive would be helpful to kind of say, okay, where are these people coming from? Are they moving into these new units that are smaller, that still have three bedrooms, but they're smaller, where they're in the 1500 square foot, even though it's a house? Or are they moving into some of the older ones? I can't answer that question because I don't know for sure. But when I'm looking at trends of migration and the correlations of those movements of trends, I definitely see um, we're not. We haven't really changed, we've increased. So I'm not sure that smaller units have done anything to dissuade our in migration that's going on. The next point, I, I do think that we're in a hot market right now. Yeah, yeah. That's, I think, definitely driving a lot of what we're seeing. Right. It's hard to predict how long the hot market's going to last. Right. But when we're taking averages of the, a year, your dad is a year old, so it's right. probably not, you know, you're compounding that uh, top market into the future. So if you take a kindergarten or your first grade, okay. and you try to look at what that class is going to look like, what we're 
doing right now is we're saying, well, our migration this year and last year from kindergarten to first grade has been 5%. From second to third, it may have been 4%. And you're compounding that forward. And what we don't know, but what I'm curious about is if the market does slow down. And I think Jay's graph kind of showed that it may have already. Um, there's going to be some bias in the model to over predict, and there's probably some other factors that are causing it to under predict. Well, yes and no, because the compounding factor, it, when I talked about multifamily impacts, I didn't assume that it was a best would be built every year. So when I added in those students, it was a one-time add. It also wasn't put into the model to be projected additionally with that compounding effect. It's a one-time, you know, this is it. So that really wasn't something that made it go up, you know, exponentially each time grows a little bit more. Um, and where the best fit model takes into account between 90 and about 132 units. So granted, if our, if it does drop down into that time period where we had, I think, 50 per year. The best fit might overestimate some of this in-migration that's going on, but we would have to drop down quite a bit for that to kind of happen. Whether it will, I don't know. I don't know any of us know for sure what's going to happen. But it is something to kind of consider, watch, see what you know, what's going on with the economy, the hot market, you know, how, what kind of housing units are, are we going to. I'm not going to talk about a new school, sort of. Uh, but <laughs> one of the things that you want to think about when you're talking about new school in the future is the worst case scenario. Yes. You want to understand where your worst case is, where your right. is, and yep. kind of the range. Do you have a, a, a good feel for what the margin of error might be as you go out for uh, the different models where right. all of these are going to be wrong, more than likely. Yep. It's going to either be high or low. Eventually. You understand yeah. How high or low would be expected. And because I, I do work with MDOE to do their projections for when they're doing construction funding dollars. And part of what they have asked me to build in are these different margins of error. And as we know, you know the closer it gets to where I did it, the, the margin of error will be less. And as it goes out, it gets more and more. Um, for what they asked me is just put it at 5 to 10 percent to see what's the high and low. When they look at the projections, they kind of circle where's the high and where's the low, kind of figure out what's in between. Um, is it perfect? No, but again, I mean, we, none of us can tell the future exactly what's going to happen, so it's one of those, okay, what well, we want to do as far as making sure our school is not undersized, like our Scarborough Middle School, I mean, mm -hmm. the day it was op open, it was too small, but, and what happened was it wasn't projected as far as what's coming down the pipeline before they built it. So, yeah, I don't have a good answer for that, but it, it also speaks to, as you get closer to finalizing figures, Looking at this again, are we still on the same path that we think that we've been on? Um, has anything changed? Yeah. Well, I, I, I just would like to say you've been remarkably accurate so far, and so I really appreciate that. And in, in when we have to make um, some of these these calls and and use um, your data for the analysis, it's yeah. been really helpful and. and I, I hear from so many different sources how unbelievably accurate it is. So thank you. Yes, I'm glad. <laughs> so thanks. Uh, I had a question, uh, and I know we're not talking about a new school, but I do know in a recent vote that, that you voted 5 to put the, the question of a new school on a November ballot. The two, two people decided. No, 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 no. Frank, so can you tell me what that vote was? Sure. The 5 2 vote? So uh, we had a vote which just, um, let, so are we, a while ago we asked um, to form a building steering committee, um, Peter Donna, and he and he looked at a lot of the data that, um, the building steering committee looked at a lot of the data that Rebecca had presented, it looked at some studies that had been done previously, the current um, programming needs and facilities that we have, um, and that, committee made a recommendation to the board that um, their recommendation was that the board should, or this committee or Andrew board, should pursue building a consolidated school, that that was their best idea of what would, that was their best solution for what they saw. Um, and so what the board did was vote on whether to accept that recommendation or not. So um, 
the, the board voted to accept it. That was the 5 2 vote. And all that means is that now that committee is authorized to take the next steps in following this path in looking into a consolidated school. That's a very technical answer. Thank you. But I'd like to know from the two people who voted against accepting that recommendation and what your rationale is for, for not. Are, are we going to follow really the yeah, 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 yeah. I saw it yeah, yeah, yeah. Not only that, Don, you yeah. could go and read and watch our meeting. Well, I'm right sorry, now. I missed it, so it's fine. Well, it's online. So, I can do that in the meanwhile, but I'm still asking the next public meeting. So, the public meeting, so should be able to. It's in public. I didn't do that, but we really didn't want to have a conversation yeah, about the school tonight. I'm jumping ahead. I apologize. It's okay. We'll have to do the next meeting. We'll be prepared. Are there any other questions for what Rebecca presented? Yes. Go ahead. I mean, oh. this one, but I'll, I'll ask it after. Rebecca, you present, I was sitting here thinking, where did I go before? Did you present it in 2017? Because I have a copy of something that was done. No, that was Aaron and Jean Marie. That was Aaron. But I know I've seen you present before something. Well, I did do this in January of 2019. Oh, okay, maybe I have yeah. yeah. to look. Yeah. But along with that, since I That's brought the this, have you guys been looking at and working yeah, on this? Yeah, that was the report okay. I was talking about that the building steering committee looked really um, in depth at. Okay, that's the one for the town council members. I sent you a link to it because it was like, yeah, when did I see this? All right, you can do it. Actually, it's a Mexican item, so I'm Okay. Rebecca, thank you. This is fantastic. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Rebecca. You're welcome. Welcome to Sam, but it's been a long time for both of you, so that you'd like to go home. Wait a second, Jay can't go home. <laughs> this is still live. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's your Thank you. 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 Thank